This week's blog post is the fourth in my series on the European portraits at the Worcester Art Museum. For more on the Worcester Art Museum, see the first post in this series. In this post, we look at four French, Spanish, and English portraits of the 19th century, not room by room, but in chronological order. First up is this portrait. There is something entrancing and very modern about this serious young woman who might be one of the artist's pupils. Guillaume Guillaume Letier, 1760 to 1832, was born free man on the Caribbean island of Guadalupe to a French official and a formerly enslaved mother. He traveled to France with his father in 1774 and by age 14 was already studying painting. He was an early adopter of the neoclassical style popularized by Jacques-Louis David and like David created history paintings that hark back to the simple virtues of the Roman Republic. When Letier returned to Paris in 1791 after studying in Rome, he supported the French Revolution. There's a link in the blog post to a site that has more about his life. Angra, another leading neoclassicist, did numerous pencil portraits of Letier. On the left is a portrait by Goya from 1815. Goya, 1746 to 1828, is one of Spain's most famous painters. Like all his portraits, this one captures the sitter's character and mood, as well as his physical appearance. Goya also produced searing history paintings, such as the 3rd of May, 1808, which is on the right. This records one among tens of thousands of brutal deaths that occurred while the Spanish were fighting Napoleon's troops. Napoleon's invasion of Spain and his exile of its monarch kicked off a series of independence movements in Spanish America. Fernandez Flores, the subject of this painting, was appointed Bishop of Quito in Ecuador to replace a bishop who had fled an insurrection, an uprising, in Quito. But Fernandez Flores was reassigned to Seville before he could take up the Quito post. Next up, a portrait by Thomas Lawrence from around 1825. Lawrence, 1769 to 1830, is the third of the great triad of British portrait painters, along with Gainsborough and Reynolds, both of whom appeared in last week's post. We have finally moved from portraits of nobles and clergy to successful businessmen. Dunlop, who is of Scots descent, was a tobacco merchant and an insurance broker. His wife was an American. And finally, this portrait by Tissot from around 1870 to 1880. Tissot, 1836 to 1902, who studied at the École des Beaux-Arts, became a notable painter, illustrator, and caricaturist. He's best known for his depictions of high fashion women of the Belle Époque in France and Victorian England. For those, he uses a combination of realistic and impressionistic styles. Among Tissot's friends were Edgar Degas, James Abbott McNeil Whistler, and Oscar Wilde. Tissot was invited to participate in the First Impressionist exhibition in 1874, but he refused. The sitter in this portrait is unidentified. The pocket watch that he holds in his hand is interesting because it first became common with the rise of railroads, which was the first method of transportation that ran on strict timetables. Next week, we will start on early American portraits at the Worcester Art Museum. A word on why I'm doing this series of posts. For the Resurrecting Romanticism Conference in October 2023, I am working on a talk on paintings at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, also known as the Columbian Exposition. One of the questions I'll be addressing is why the organizers of the exposition and the painters whose works appeared there were so very keen to surpass the buildings and the exhibitions of the 1889 Paris World's Fair. To remind myself of the development of European and American painting over time, this series of posts is a quick overview of European portraits from the Renaissance to the 19th century, followed by American portraits. Eventually, I will do some posts on other paintings at the Worcester Art Museum. If the history of Western painting interests you, check out my Innovators in Painting, a 140-page survey focusing on innovations that gave painters more power to make their viewers stop, look, and think about paintings. DianeDurantiWriter.com has hundreds of posts on sculpture, painting, architecture, and my other obsessions. 
To join the Sunday Recommendations email list, visit the URL on the screen or email me. And you can say, well done, Diane, or support my work and receive rewards by means of the tip jar on dianedurantywriter.com. As always, thank you for listening.